<laughs> Bali internet, not 100% reliable. He's back with us, ladies and gentlemen. Carl Zha is here of the Silk and Steel podcast, which talks about Chinese culture, history, politics. Uh, he's also been tweeted out by a lot of good independent journalists like Max Blumenthal, Mark Sloboda, and the Gray Zone. And he's given us great perspective on what was on the ground happening in Hong Kong, at least a different perspective from the Western media. Back with us, Carl Zha. How you doing, buddy? How are you? Good, man. You sound clearer now. It looks like we got through. Maybe we can have a great show and talk about this because we were getting to a good point. I was asking you about America's image of Chinese people because of Western media. Pretty much a lot of American people feel that a lot of Chinese people are quiet and reserved because of an authoritarian government always looking and censoring what they say over their shoulders. But that isn't the case from what you were saying, is it? Why don't you tell us about where you come from? And then when you lived, and what about the Western media? You compared it to an elephant's ass, correct? Go ahead. <laughs> yes, yes. So as I was saying, um, I was born in China in 1976, right after the end of Cultural Revolution. And I have really witnessed the transformation of China from a very poor country uh, back in 1980s to the superpower that it is today. Uh, it's. I came to United States when I was 13 years old. Uh, when I um, and uh, so I attended high school and college here in U.S. So I kind of, it, it, I kind of understand the both side, and I do feel there need to be a a bridge to to bridge the gap between the two cultures, the the, the U American culture and and the Chinese culture, because there's so little understanding of China and Chinese culture here in U.S. And uh, that's the primary reason I started the Silk and Steel podcast. Yeah. Uh, and another, uh, though, I like to say China is like a big elephant, and we are all blind men filling up the elephant because China is such a huge, complex society with 1.4 billion people. What the Western media tend to do, though, is their laser focus on the elephant's ass. Mm -hmm. So what they report sometimes may have a grain of truth in it. But if all the picture you're getting uh, about China is from the Western media, you're getting a very distorted view of China. So instead of seeing the elephant for what it is, you are just seeing a bunch of crap. <laughs> That's what's coming out the elephant's ass, a bunch of crap. Well, I mean, I, I think the reason why American uh, or Western imperialism, if you want to say it, is so concerned about what China is doing right now is because China, like you said, when you were there, it's, it was a poor country into what it is. It's the superpower now today. How did they obtain that? You know, uh, becoming such a big power? Because a lot of people don't understand how China really just, you know, uh, there's now talk, and, and this is really talk out there, that there's actually Chinese lobbyists buying people within the Congress. And I don't find that to be true. I, I see it as American imperialists or American elites took advantage of that cheap Chinese labor years ago, and because of it, China has become a superpower because they were so dependent on Chinese good, goods. Is, can you give a little bit into that perspective? Yeah, I think you're onto something there because... When I uh, lived in China in 1980s, uh, China just emerged out of 10-year turmoil of cultural revolution. Um, you know, China was desperately uh, poor and desperately in need of capital. So what the Chinese government did is they followed the philosophy of you build it, they will come, right? So they granted a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, tax breaks and preference treatment for to in order to attract overseas capital to invest in China. On top of that, you know, the, the, as you mentioned, all the multinational corporations in the West, they just salivating to take advantage of cheap labor in China. So this this combination of the ending of the Cold War and also normalization of a relationship between China and United States after the Nixon visit created this perfect storm, and and um, you know this this uh, one thing ha you have to keep in mind though, from China's perspective, it's not really so much China rising 
as China re-emerging. Because uh-huh. for thousands of years, China had been uh, the number one economy in the world just by its sheer size. And in fact, China was number one economy in the world until 1850s. And that's when uh, you know the, the British started the Opium War to force China to accept a drug trade, which is a force upon the Chinese. So, so until very recently, I mean, in the in, in the Chinese timeline recently, you know, until about 100 years ago, you know, China was still the preeminent power in East Asia. It was the center of the culture and civilization. Yeah. I mean, when you and, listen, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Keep going. And, you know, the that, that's why Chinese often refer to the period from start of opium war in 1840 to uh, to 1949 as the century of humiliation because this in this hundred years China was really brought down low by the encroachment of Western imperialism you know first by the British and then uh, American and Japanese and yeah. it's it's only like in the la- later half of the 20th century that China finally gained its own sovereignty back. Uh, you know, that happened under People's Republic of China. But uh, as we know, you know, China had, was undergoing a lot of internal tom- turmoils from 1950s through 1976. After I was born, what happened was, you know, China finally put its house in order. And because it with this uh, gain of its sovereignty back, now China could set its own rules on how they allow the Western capitals to come back in. You know, for example, for the for those multinationals who want to do business in China, the rule was that they will have to set up joint ventures with the local partners, in at least initially, and they have to agree to technology transfer. Yes. Now. Now, let's remember in the beginning, back in the 80s, 90s, most of the multinational corporations from the U.S. are okay with that because they're just so, um, they're just couldn't wait to get inside the Chinese market and to take advantage of the cheap Chinese labor. They agree to all these terms. Yeah. Right? I, it's only- let's talk about that, though. Let's stay right there for a second yes. because that's a, that that first the, your first five minutes. I got like 19 questions. I want to talk about the culture and the history of of China and the Silk Road because I listen to your podcast now. And man, it was so amazing. And people just were not taught that in American history. Uh, and then also like talk a little bit about Xi Jinping and what he's done there. But really the, the question I want to ask you right now what we're talking about, since you're talking about like, you know, people took advantage, Western corporations took advantage of cheap Chinese labor. Isn't there something to be said about that, about the way the government used almost, you know, what people would say, and I'm only pushing back because I want you to, to explain this, but the yeah. way the Chinese government used really cheap labor to build their country up to what it is nowadays, isn't there something wrong with that or is there a reason that you can say that's that what china had to do that to become the power they are today go ahead yeah well i was born in 1976 i still remember 1980s when uh my grandparents got the first black and white television that was bought for them by my mom for her saving and in 1980s china couldn't produce anything of its own we had to import you know the japanese transistor radio it, ha- it has to import fertilizers right you know china china has oil china has own oil field but they they didn't have a a, a petrochemical industry advanced enough to process th- this oil into uh to process the oil into fertilizer so china actually exported crude oil to places like japan and then import chemical fertilizers. So mm. China in the 1980s was basically um, a export of raw commodities and import of uh, processed goods, right? Okay. So in order to climb that technology chain, you know, China had to basically open its economy up to welcome the the overseas capital to come in to to develop the Chinese industry, um, you know, the, you know, the, at the time, you know, China's 
China's uh, was not was uh, technologically backwards. You know, China in nineteen eighties was not even the in, industrial base was built initially in nineteen fifties under the Soviet help, mm-hmm. but. In 1980s, the vast majority of Chinese population, 80% of the Chinese population in 1980s were rural. There were uh, f- peasant farmers living off the land. The, the, they're basically leading a subsistent uh, farming, you know, because a lot, lot of, not even a lot of machineries were used because uh, China couldn't produce a lot of farm tool at the time, right? So yeah. This is the kind of the context that I want to give to people through my podcast. Uh, it's important to understand that because how do you develop right from such a low base? And these are the the, the, the fact is that the people in the countryside in China they want opportunities, they want jobs, they want to go to the city to to participate in uh, the, the broader economy. And, 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 you know, China was actually very successful in integrating its own economy into the global economy to participate in the globalization. And, and you know, like I said, they, their, their, their philosophy was uh, you build it, they will come. And they will, yes, they will welcome um, multi, Western multinationals to come into China to allow them to utilize the the cheap Chinese labor, but at the same time, because China has retained sovereignty, they could set rules they could, and regulations on how these Western companies could operate inside China. They have to uh, transfer technology to their Chinese partners. You know, they have to uh, set up the, the their, their factories um, in China to not just for resource extraction. To you know, to, in a lot yeah. of I live. In Indonesia right now, you know, Indonesia is still very much a resource based economy where like uh, mining companies from U.S. and Australia, they come in and, you know, they, they maybe bribe the government officials and they, they get these contracts to operate large, uh, large mines and then just take them out of the country. And a lot of the wealth is gone. But yeah, in China's case. The government requires the Western companies doing business in China to set up factories and to also not just for resource extraction. They have to make certain parts in China. They have to they have to, uh, uh, you know, initially China was a place where, um, you know, making shoes, right, making shoes and cheap toys for the Western consumers. But the, the Chinese government. Uh, put stipulation that okay, that's that's not enough. You have to do tra- uh, technology transfer. You have to, uh, you know, bring your machineries over. You have to uh, 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 produce. Make sure a certain number of parts are produced in China. So what happened is gradually, a whole supply chain start to form in China. So now, uh, you know, the, the 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 how China became the factory of the world is. Is not just a story of cheap labor. There are tons of countries in the global south that have cheap labor, right? But what they don't have is they don't have the infrastructure, right? they don't have ports, uh, power plants, uh, railroads, highways. They don't have uh, they don't have like a, 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 a like a like ecosystem of industries, you know, like like supply for to produce car, right? Like you know, car has many parts. But, you know, if you have all your suppliers in one place, it became so easy to build up a, a vertical industry. Right. But, so you. that's what China has managed to down in the last 30 years, which is very impressive. And it was it was almost down from the scratch. How much credit do we give Xi Jinping's government for lifting people out of poverty? And what was the main way they lifted people out of poverty? Was it still just from producing goods? Uh, so many goods that the United States bought that they were allowed, they were able to lift their people uh, out of uh, poverty, or is there something else to that? Well, um, I mean, she, so so the, the the Chinese poverty alleviation program started way before Xi Jinping, right? So as I mentioned, I was born in 1976 after Mao died, um, and after you know, from what 
what I know from since I grew up, you know, the Chinese government have been working on poverty alleviation, uh, and and what the you know a, a very common refrain in the Western media is that you know the Chinese government did not uplift the people, the Chinese people uplifted themselves, kind of like the. Uh, Horatio Alger story of Chinese people pull themselves by bootstraps, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, the counter argument I have for that is Chinese people have always been hardworking. You know, it's not like the Chinese people of 19th centuries were lazier than ch Chinese people of 2020, right? Chinese people have always been hardworking. Why is it then, you know, from 1840 to, to, to 1949 that, that that entire century was so horrible for the Chinese people to live in it? You know, to 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 live. You know, Chinese China suffered through foreign invasions, wars, plague, famine in all these years. Uh, what is the difference? I mean, I mean, it's obvious to me that the governance plays a huge role, right? In terms of providing a stability, providing security, and providing. Uh, uh, be people to be just be able to lead on with their normal lives. That kind of ties back to what we said earlier about you know how people live their life in China. I mean, I m most young people in China are not political. They because they're too busy to pursue their uh, different interests. That that's something that really um, happened in you know in the last thirty forty years. There I there was a lot of government control when I. Uh, when I, w I lived in China in 1980s, right? Because in yeah. 1980s, uh, back then, you can go to college. Uh, you know, the, the, the college was paid for by the government. You don't have to. You don't have to pay a tuition. But the the caveat is, once you graduate, the government assign you a job. So oh. in China back then, you know, from Government assigns everybody, uh, you know, kind of from cradle to grave. Um, you you don't have much a choice about you know what kind of work you're going into. You you get a job assigned to you. That was uh, then in the eighties, right? Yes, yes, and that's another thing that um, China, China's uh, opening and reform of its economy has brought is the personal freedom. Now you know with different. Yes, the Western uh, multinationals are rushing into China, of course, for their own <laughs> reasons, for their own re to 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 increase profit, to exploit Chinese labor. But at the same time, because at the time China was so poor, the additional capital coming into China actually also created opportunities, you know, for these uh, for these poor country girls to go into the city and work in factories and earn an income to support their family. And, and some of them went on to, uh, you know, get themselves educated and to get better jobs. And, and, and this is happening in China over and over again. I mean, China, so my, uh, to give a more like a personal story, anecdotal story, my my father. So I have family from different side of China. My my father's family live in a very small rural town. In 1990, before I left China, uh, I remember hanging out with my cousin in my par my my dad's hometown. And the tallest building in the town was this four story uh, apartment store, uh, department store, mm -hmm. and. When I went back in 2001, I was shocked because it was a city. It was became a, a legitimate city. They have like they have stadiums, they have um, high rises everywhere, highways. Uh, I was it was totally unrecognizable, right? It's it's but that urbanization was happening in China all over the place. All the you know the the eighty percent of the people that used to live in farms, you know, living very hard life, it's itching a living from subsistence farming are now moving into cities. Then now they're getting jobs in the factories. And now, you know, some of them get an education, they're working service jobs, they become managers and so on and so forth. And that lift people, that's how people get lifted from the poverty. That's awesome. That's awesome. Also, too, like, you know, I was talking about, you know, and if you get a chance, ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and check out the Silk and Steel podcast. What a treat, you know. Um, every single time I look at your Twitter page, though, I get hungry. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, because like you said, it's the uh, before before we got you, you know distorted up on the uh, earlier broadcast. You said that ninety five percent of Chinese culture is food, and I said same thing with Italian culture. Um, but this really tells me something about people, because like I say, we build bridges over dinner, and the the food yeah. culture you put up on your channel. I want to talk about the Raja Moore real quick. Let me play this quick video. And, you know, if I ever get the same role of Anthony Bourdain, Carl, I want you to be my tour guide and take me for food all over China. But let, let's take a look at this. You put this up there. I, I, how do you say it? It's not Raja Moore. How do you say it? Zhou Jia Moore. But a lot of Western expat call it Roger Moore because that's how he kind of how he sounds. All right. Let's take, uh, take a look at this video of uh, uh, Roja Moore. Okay. <laughs> what is this beautiful thing that makes me want to cry? I see different ways. I see different meats. I see different sauces. Tell me about this Chinese street food and where it could be found. Yes. Um, so in the northwestern part of China, in the ancient Chinese capital of Xi'an, um, this uh, Xi'an used to be the Chinese capital for a thousand years, so you retain a lot of the traditional culture. And and like I said, mentioned earlier, different regions of China have their own special regional cuisine. And Xi'an street food is famous. This is, Zhou Jia Mo is one of the signature dish of Xi'an street food, and it's just kind of it's kind of like a torta, right? Like a like a Mexican torta. Um, but it's it's a stuffed bread with different kind of meat. Uh, just talking about it is making my mouth water right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get something. I'm gonna go get a torta now. You know, uh, can we get these in the states anywhere? Um, I believe so. Now with more Chinese uh, immigrants living in U.S., there are places selling zhou jia mo. I have to ask my uh, 41. K uh, Twitter followers where they can find them and then I'll let you know. Please let us know where we can find that. I need to have that in my system sooner or later. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, wait, you are in LA, right? Yeah, in LA. Um, oh, yeah. You have a lot of options. I mean, like um, in I. I went to school in Caltech. Uh, that's when I start moving to LA from Chicago. And back when I was in school, the area in Monterey Park, um, you know, a lot get a lot of uh, immigrants from Hong Kong and Taiwan. So at that time, there were already Monterey Park was kind of mecca for Chinese food. Uh, but at the time, mostly Hong Kong and Taiwan food. Uh, but in the last 20, 10, 20 years, there's a lot of more um, immigrants from mainland China. So now you can actually get all kind of uh, uh, regional food from mainland China in Monterey Park. You know, like I get, I can, I get even my hometown dishes. Uh, my, I'm from Chongqing in southwestern part of China. Um, the, it, I don't know if you heard about the Sichuan, Sichuanese cuisine. It's very spicy, very hot. I've heard um, of it. Yes, I've heard of it. and uh, yeah. and um, the, like because and there's special Sichuan peppercorn that give us give your tongue a little numbing sensation. Uh, yeah. It's great. Highly, highly recommend. And, I like and, the know, sweetness they put with that with with that particular type of uh, pepper too, as well. So it's kind of like that. It's almost like I call it an Asian moly of sorts. It's like that dark, decadent, rich beautifulness, and you can really yes. feel the heat on the back end. You know, my my fiance Annie complained about uh, me posting food all the time because she's like, "You're making me hungry." You know, when are you taking me to China? So you know, I, you know, you know what? If I'm looking at that your, your Twitter late at night, it's it. I'm going to the refrigerator and stuff. We were talking about what we're gonna have for dinner after. It's like now I want that. I want that Chinese street food. Is that more like Mandarin or Cantonese? Um, so China has um, like actually different regional dialects. Like Xi'an, they speak a, a dialect of Mandarin, uh, but you know, like the the uh, it's in in northwestern part of part of China. I mean, like I uh, I, I grew up in Sichuan, right? Which is uh, Sichuan have its own 
uh, regional dialect, and the the, the dialect Sichuanese supposedly okay, Mandarin is really um, a language family. What well, when we talk about Mandarin in the United States, we're talking about standard Mandarin. Standard Mandarin is kind of the the common language that was used all over China in order for people to communicate with each other. Because my, well, I grew up with my mom's side of the family in Chongqing, right? And so I grew up in sp speaking Sichuanese, but my dad's side of the family came from the area around Shanghai, and they speak a different dialect, the, the Wu dialect. And so my... <laughs> I, when I travel to see my grandparents on my dad's side, uh, you know, sometimes I have a little bit problem communicate with my grandparents because they speak their own dialect and I don't, and and they they're too old so they don't speak the standard Mandarin. <laughs> so I need translation from my cousins, you know, so who who have learned standard Mandarin in school. Uh, but that's kind of the diversity within yeah. China. I think if I go there, I'm going to remember the regions by food. So when yes. I go there, you got to take me all around so we can try all the food out there. I think it's amazing. So Let's um, do it. you talked about censorship a long time ago. Would you say yes. that that censorship is kind of lightened up or loosened up or, you know, it's not always Big Brother and Xi Jinping's government looking over your shoulders? Because people tell me all the time, like, Pasta, you cannot have the combo couch if you're in China. Um, what do you say to that kind of language? In, okay, you know? so... This is this is a very complicated topic because I yes I complain about Chinese censorship all the time because it, it affect me because I used to be an active user on Chinese social media and and when I gather a large following at one point I had five million followers on Chinese Weibo right which wow. is kind of the equivalent of Twitter that's the difference between Weibo and Twitter you know people say what's the difference well the difference is. You can have <laughs> tons of followers just because there's so many more users in China. Uh, you know, like it's it's normal. Like like five million is nothing. You know, the, the, a Chinese actress, a famous Chinese actress, would have you know tens uh, tens of million uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of followers. Yeah, and and. Uh, but what this is how censorship works. They when I started um, in in China when I started participating in Chinese social media, uh, I didn't feel as uh, much censorship just because you know I, I I was a small account. I didn't have much followers, so I don't have much impact. But as I gained five million followers, I I did gain a lot more scrutiny, and that's when I noticed my posts are some of my posts are getting censored right it's not that you can't have your own independent voice or independent podcast is that uh if you reach a critical level <laughs> then you will be examined you, you will be put under microscope that's a that's a one thing i that's my biggest complaint actually okay. about china well what, what, what do they look for once they get you under the microscope what are they looking for you talking out against the government or the, I mean, what is the things that they don't like? Because I sit over here and I yell at Nancy Pelosi and my democratic left. I mean, I yell, I say, eat the rich all the time over here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I'm so disgusted with our government and I'm so disgusted with them backdoor censoring us by shadow banning us, demonetizing us, not letting yes. us get going. It's a different type of censorship. We have the illusion that we're yes. free but we're really yeah. not. But what does the Chinese government censor more than anything? Is it okay. talking against well, them? The, the thing is the Chinese government, they actually got the the those corporate um, entity to do the censorship for them. For I, I mentioned about Weibo. Weibo is owned by Sina. This is a, uh, this is a Chinese media company. But the, what Chinese government will do is they issue certain guidelines. But those guidelines are very broad, and those media companies, in order not to run afoul of the government censors, they kind of sometimes go overdrive to, you know, like to, they, they, what they do is, for example, they will have a filter list, right? Like the, like, um, some, if you, for example, um, I, one time I was trying to, I wrote a historical post about something that happened in 1864 in Xinjiang, right? And I noticed it was getting zero views, and I was confused because I, I didn't think there's any content in the in my post was questionable. It was just talking about history. So I, I had to 
the, 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 that's another thing I complain about censorship in China because it's lack of transparency. They, they don't tell you that these are the rules, you know, yeah. like then don't that, like they never tell you what the rules are. So you kind of have to figure it out by yourself. It's like YouTube. <laughs> YouTube's yes, the same yes. thing. They're like, oh, we found content that doesn't meet our guidelines. We're taking you down. What? Yes. And, and, and in China, also, a lot of the censor are, uh, censorship is subjective because they have, uh, um, initially, they have a lot of humans looking over uh, the your, your post if they're being reported or, or, you know, if they're being reported, they have human moderators looking at your post. And, and you really depend on that censor you know so, so sometimes i have same type of content you will go through and then other time you wouldn't because a different guy was looking at it right <laughs> because so it's, it's it's sometimes it's an exercise in frustration sometimes you get lucky like maybe the the, the guy on duty that time was more liberal <laughs> and yeah. the, 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 the guy that happened to look at your latest post is an asshole then it, it i really i'm more upset now because I see more of that happening in U.S. as well. It's happening in Facebook, in Twitter, and in YouTube, as you mentioned. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I, it's like, it's like, like we are, like, like America is adopting like the worst aspect of China. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's that upset me. Well, you know what? I mean, I, I and I think you're telling me it's like you know they kind of shadow ban you, you, they take you down. A lot of people get this image like they show up at your door, like you know we're here to take you away for speaking out. We're going to throw you in a, a concentration camp for re-educating uh, you, you know? Yeah. And they, no. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I, I can speak from experience because uh, they can't touch me because I'm American citizen, right? And I, I don't even live in China. So if I, if I just, if I like start do a, a multi-thread, you know, ran against Xi Jinping or whatever, they will probably just spam me, you know, they just remove my account, that's it. But for people inside China, it is a little bit different. You know, I have, uh, what I used to do is I used to know a group of uh, uh, Chinese social media users, they would post videos and images from Syrian war, right? They would just like get these videos from Twitter and then they they post them inside China. So this is a this is an aspect a lot of Americans don't realize. They they know about the Great Firewall, about how China is like, uh, you know how, how supposedly the Chinese people don't know what's happening outside. But in in actuality, there's a lot of way around the firewall because, for example, there's a lot of Chinese out outside of China now. A lot of Chinese living, studying in the United States, in Europe, in other parts of the world. And they can also get on Weibo and WeChat. And they can also take that information and post it. And and that's kind of like the back door through the Great Firewall, right? And yeah. so some of these uh, group of people, they're mostly young college students, they, so they will post these uh, videos uh, you know, sometimes the ISIS videos <laughs> in China. But then after the Paris attack, I think that was around 2015 or 2016. I don't remember the exact year. Uh, then China started to crack down on um, like the video content in China that could be possibly um, labeled as a, a spreading, you know, terrorism, right? Like so, so like uh, like how like ISIS videos are now being removed from YouTube. Yeah. But but they the 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 way they apply the rule is very arbitrary and and you know some you know people will post uh, just a straight up a, a clip of fighting or or you know sometimes even have um uh uh, uh this, some of them post like maybe even just just a just a media uh, a clip of the the, the 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 Syrian state TV or something they, they get censored and yeah, people didn't understand yeah. people didn't understand that and and I got to know a person who actually got paid a visit from the Chinese police right so he he was posting um, a bunch of uh, flags uh, like of these various Syrian uh, anti-government uh, rebel groups. Um, and one of the flag was this uh, Turkmen front in Syria, but the the Turkmen front flag is very similar to the the Uyghur independence movement, the the East Turkestan <laughs> flag, 
Yes. They, they're very similar. You know, blue background with a crescent and star, except the Turkmen flag has a, has a stripe across it. But because he posted that, uh, which has nothing to do with Uyghur or, or Easter, Easter uh, Turkestan independence movement, he got called in by the Chinese police. Uh, this is euphemistically called the, you know, they invite you for tea. Basically, he got um, invited to the police station. So they told him, you know, you have to stop posting stuff like this. The, he, he tried to explain that he's not trying to do, but they told him just, just you know, just stop. Just just stop posting anything related to to Syrian war and uh, any it post any videos that's in Arabic um, and and. I, in the beginning, I didn't understand. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. But then you have to think about how the Chinese censor system works, because a lot of the Chinese censors, they're 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 you know they're, they're they don't get paid very much. So these people are probably you know like high school graduates or whatever, and they they don't know Arabic. They don't know what it's been spoken in the video, right? Yeah. So for them, they see a video speaking Arabic. They because they don't know. They will just ban it because they don't want to take the chance that that the, the Arabic in the video was somehow like ISIS propaganda or something. Yeah, I hear you. And so, so, so this kind of blanket enforcement it's, it creates a lot of frustration, you know, in in China in in Chinese. Like I mentioned, there are um, you know there are police visit. I mean, he was he was visited by a police and and in in the end, like he has to basically. Um, there was a police officer that was assigned to to talk to him, check up on him uh, once a week, and after a while, they actually became friends. <laughs> yeah. they, they hang out, but but that's how he actually get the information. That's how I got to learn a little bit about how the Chinese censorship program works through yeah. him, because now he's a buddy on the <laughs> on the police force. And I, and I also know a, a Chinese uh, youth, a Chinese uh, college grad who was thinking about going to Syria to join the YPG to fight ISIS, and we, he, he even uh, he got into contact with this uh, group, Lions of Rojava on Facebook, and you know a lot of people use VPN by the way in China to get over the Great Firewall to get on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, etc. Um, and so he he joined. He was planning to fly to Turkey and then <laughs> and then join go to this place in North. East Syria to join this uh, Kurdish militia to fight ISIS, and then uh, you know, of course, they were talking about this in a WeChat group uh, of like I don't know, hundred people, and then <laughs> the, the Chinese police find out about it, and so they paid him a visit. So then he had to check in with the Chinese police every week to make sure he he didn't leave the country, and they they take away his passport for a while so they can, he can't just leave and go join fighting. Fighting in Syria, so so these are the kind of things that do happen. There, 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 yeah. there are I hear certain you. restrictions that that we as Americans will probably would not be getting used to. I mean, even Chi as a lot of Chinese youth are kind of chafing under this kind of uh, <laughs> under this kind of control. So that's that certainly exists, but uh, it's not as bad as you will get sent to a concentration camp or anything like that. So we're talking with Carl Za of the Silk and Steel podcast. If you want to learn about Chinese culture history about the silk road go to his podcast check him out he also talks a little politics he gave everybody a great insight to what's going on to hong kong carl that's definitely different i think than a lot of people think what the real censorship is like I, it is obviously concerning you know um however uh due to the history and the aggressiveness against china with american imperialism i can see why they would be a little bit uh shaky or scattered or sketched uh, and sure. might react like that way but let's talk about in China because you kind of talked about yep. the YPG over there and that one region. A lot of people, Xinjiang is a hot spot for Western media to kind of go out there and, and, and talk against the Chinese government. Muslims in China. Now, I saw a post you put up with a blogger um, real quick. Are, are Muslims in China, uh, and, and you know, I get a lot of insight when I listen to your podcast about this stuff because you talk about the way Buddhism was like exported from India into China. Uh, yes. And we could talk about how Muslims... Uh, how Islam really took yes. root in China and stuff like that. But Chinese people in, uh, excuse me, Muslim people in China, are they looked upon differently just because they are practicing the faith of Islam? Um, okay, so there are, China is a huge place. And 
that is, is there are you know the, the number of Muslims in China runs into tens of millions. I mean, the, uh, uh, the there's actually and there are different ethnic groups within this. Uh, you know, a lot of times people are talking about Muslims in China, they automatically thinking about Uy Uyghurs from Xinjiang because that's in the news. Uh, but in fact, there are other Chinese Muslim groups. Um, in, in fact, the the, the there's a large. Uh, Chinese speaking Muslim group that had lived in China for uh, thousands of you know over a thousand years you know the, the Islam came to China uh, very early on you know uh, you know when the when the um, Arab Caliphate started to expand uh, a lot of the Arab merchants they you know they, they travel on the maritime Silk Road into to the places like uh, Guangzhou or Canton the Cantonese area to trade and so they founded their own uh, communities there and and a lot of their descendants still live there today these are you know descendants from the Arab and Persian traders along the Silk Road and they have a largely uh, you know a, a, they basically um, adopted a lot of local culture but at the same time preserved their religious practice so they're Muslim but they uh, you know other than the the, the religion uh, you know their their appearance everything else uh, almost very similar to the locals right so so the, the people unless so for the the Chinese speaking Muslim the, the Hui people unless they wear their white skull cap you don't even know they're Muslim right that you know unless they go to the mosque I have a um, I actually had a friend um, in in elementary school in Chongqing in 1980s. Uh, they they're from a Muslim family, but I actually didn't know they were Muslim until um, his brother uh, was testing for high school. Because in China, they there's a sort of affirmative action for ethnic minorities, and and uh, as, as Muslim, they are entitled to get. A uh, couple points added with in their um, in their high school and college entrance exams, right? So his brother, uh, who who is also a classmate of my sister, uh, he's actually pretty. You know, he was top five of his class or or whatever. Uh, but people suddenly discover he's he's Muslim because <laughs> when he applied for high school, you know, he he's he specified that he's he's Muslim, and so he got. You know some additional score, <laughs> and, then, and then people was like, "What? You mean you're Muslim?" And, so let me but, get this straight, Carl. Carl, yeah. so you're saying it's kind of like America, where you really don't like, you know, you know nobody's religion. It's not worn, you know, it's not like known where yeah. the way a lot of people feel that like Western media is betrayed that you know you know Muslims in China they kind of stick out and they're not treated as equals. Um, but you're saying it's just a lot like America, like a lot of people don't wear their religion on their shoulder and kind of flaunt it. Yeah. You didn't know to is it is it like that throughout China? No, no. So so what I speak about is uh, the the Muslim that in the in the living in the um, in the, the the Han majority area. So so Chinese China is a multi ethnic nation, but with a you know like a like a overwhelming majority are Han Chinese. I think ninety percent of the people are Han Chinese. But most of the Han Chinese population live um, kind of towards the east. You know, the, the much of the western China is populated by non Han Chinese people. The you know so called ethnic minority. So in Xinjiang is a particular case. Xinjiang is in the northwest part of China. It, it's a huge place area, uh, the size of Alaska, right? So it's huge, and and the people there have a different culture because uh, you know Xinjiang is more in in terms of culture. Xinjiang is part of the Central Asia. So so people in Xinjiang like the Uyghurs. They culturally they're similar to people across the border in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and all the former Central uh, Asian, former Central Asian Soviet republics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. They so this also speak a different uh, language, speak a Turkic language, uh, and 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 their appearance is different. So they look Central Asian, right? And then you know, like uh, you know, I don't know if if you have page image of Afghan, right? So like uh, so so people in Xinjiang that could look anywhere from like they could look like an Afghan or Persian or Indian or or Mongolian or you know just. They, they, some of them could look like other Han Chinese. So there's a, there's a spectrum. So while some people in Xinjiang, some Uyghur may be able, their appearance may pass for Han Chinese, but I think uh, a, a huge portion of the Uyghur people, they are visible minorities. So you can, it's like the East Asians in US, right? <laughs> They're like visible minority. People, people can tell they're different. So. So in, in, in Xinjiang's case, that they they are, uh, and and particularly because um, the the history of Xinjiang is, it's even though it has been part of the Chinese Empire for a long time, um, you know the last time China, Xinjiang was incorporated into the Chinese Empire was in 17, 1760, so just before the United States was founded. But yeah. the the way that you know, under the imperial dynasty, the China was rule is that each regions basically maintain its own autonomy. As long as you pay taxes and pledge allegiance to the emperor, they kind of leave you alone, right? And so, so these regions maintain their own separate uh, cultural, uh, ethnic, and religious identity. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yes, and and uh, and. And but Xinjiang is also a very diverse place because uh, you know as as a result of history, Xinjiang is right now is kind of a, uh, uh, it, it has about forty different ethnic groups. The Uyghur is uh, the main ethnic group in Xinjiang, but there's also a large size uh, Han Chinese population in Xinjiang. I think the split recently is like forty forty six percent Uyghur about 36% Han Chinese and then like like 9% Kazakhs and some tur other Turkic Muslims uh, and there's also Hui, yeah. Mongols, uh, except it's like China is a plethora of ethnicity, right? There's, yeah, there's yeah. a tons of living in Xinjiang and uh, after the founding of the People's Republic of China, uh, you know, the <clears throat> under the influence of the policy of Soviet Union, Autonomous region was set up in Xinjiang. So the official name of Xinjiang is Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and it was specified that you know the Xinjiang uh, chairman of Xinjiang region has to be a Uyghur, right? And 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 also the 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 people in Xinjiang they are entitled to be educated in their own language. So the Uyghurs would go to Uyghur school, the Kazakhs would, would go to the Kazakh school, the Tajiks will go to the Tajik school, and the Mongols will go to the Mongol school. They will be, you know, educated in their own language, which I don't think, you know, like this, this kind of program, you know, we know in U.S. there's bilingual education, et cetera, but that didn't really um, exist until much more, much more recent times. Okay. But it, I want to talk a little bit about that, though. I want to talk okay. a little bit about that. Okay, go ahead. And, and uh, because I want, while we're here, you just said there's all these different ethnic groups within that, that area. We're talking about Xinjiang, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, first of all, there are a lot of mosques that are open in Western China. I want to just show a really quick clip because yes. I want to get a sense of a lot of people think what's going on in Western China. You know, they see the BBC video and they talk about the Uyghurs and they think that they're just jailed simply because they are a Uyghur of Muslim yeah. faith. But I just want to show real quick, because you put this up. Uh, Johnny, I got it marked at 229. I just want to show a little bit of a mosque that opened in this Western is China. My it's not loading. Okay, of course it's not loading. Um, anyways, you talked about the schools they go to. In other words, they're educated in their own language. Is that necessarily good, whatnot, or does that still keep the religious divide? Did we get it going? 
Um, well, I mean, the vast majority of the Uyghurs are Muslims, right? I mean, the, this is a. Uh, this is kind of the uh, you know since the, the the area of Xinjiang used to be Buddhist majority until um, about 12th century, uh, especially after the Mongol conquest. Um, you know, the, after the the Mongol Khan who were uh, ruling the region converted to Islam, and you know the the all his subject were. You know, required to take up on Islam as faith. So, so Xinjiang has been um, Muslim for last eight hundred years or so, right? And okay, and uh, you know, the, the Islam is very much part of the Uyghur cultural life. It's it's like a, uh, it, it's 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 kind of like in U.S. people are. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, if you're born into a Christian family, it doesn't really matter whether you go to church or regularly or not, but it's just assume you are Christian. Kind of like, like, like culturally, there, it was part of the cultural fabric, right? Um, I mean, U- U.S. now is a lot more secular than, <laughs> than 50 years ago, but you kind of get the same idea. And, and the, so, yes, so, so, so. Islam is a very uh, prominent feature in, uh, in, uh, in, in Xinjiang and in the Uyghur life. Um, but it, you are right, because Xinjiang is also a home of other ethnicities, that there's a, there are significant non-Muslim population in Xinjiang, right? I mean, but that, that just kind of happens kind of naturally in most of the world. I mean, I'm in Bali, uh, Indonesia right now. Indonesia itself is a majority Muslim country, but yeah. Bali itself is Hindu, is majority Hindu. But then again, we get a lot of people in Bali from other islands in, in Indonesia. So, so, so there's a lot of Muslims as well in Bali, right? Yeah. I mean, there are mostly people practice their own religions and and uh, and and I'm sure there are prejudices on 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 all sides but overall people still live their life and get along right Do you think that the Chinese government is justified in the treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang so I personally I'm a little bit conflicted about what's going on in Xinjiang because I in in terms of a uh, the from the Chinese government perspective, they they're not so much concerned about whether whether Uyghur practice practice Islam or, or is practice Muslim or not. The Chinese government perspective is that Xinjiang remain integral part of the Chinese territory, right? And that's their their main. So they're they're more concerned about they're more uh, concerned about the separatists rather than yeah. the Islamic fundamentalist faction that a lot of people talk about. In other words, I believe there was a lot of Uyghurs that went over to Syria to fight, and that form of fundamentalism was really scaring the Chinese government. But yes. you're saying that it also has to do with the separatists that yes. want to de- uh, detach from China. Yes. I mean, like in Xinjiang, the kind of the uh, ethnic separatism and the religious fundamentalism, sometimes it gets mixed together, right? I mean, like the... Um, and, you know, Islam is already part of, uh, you know, Uyghur culture, but in, 19, you know, in the early part of the PRC rule, Xinjiang was very much influenced by Soviet Union, right? So Soviet Union is, as we know, it's, it's a communist country, it's, uh, it's Soviet Central Asia, which that the, the Uyghurs of Xinjiang is cultural, have cultural tie with, was very secular. And so, so Xinjiang itself was very secular in the um, in the latter half of the 20th century, and um, and and some. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, right, and and especially after the start of Afghan War, the war in Afghanistan, that's when U.S. and Saudi Arabia poured a lot of funds. You know, CIA had the, their largest uh, yep. operation, Operation Cyclone. Uh, you know, working in close relationship with Saudi Arabia, built a whole bunch of... Uh, You're talking uh, about Jimmy Carter back in the cyclone was when he funded the Mujahideen, right? Yes, yes. So they, you're telling they, me that some of that money went to Western Xinjiang to, to no, feed some no, of the fundamentalists no. there? 
No, no, no. But there was a spill uh, over effect because and in 19, okay. In 1980s, China was actually in the Western camp, uh, in the anti-Soviet camp. You know, after one of the main reason Nixon went over to China in 1972 is to get China on U.S. side versus Soviet Union because of the Sino-Soviet split. So when Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, um, China sided with United States. So at the time. Um, you know, for example, United States, they didn't want to directly provide weapons to Mujahideen that could be traced to NATO. So so CIA purchased a lot of Chinese made weapons. Yes. Uh, and, and because Chinese made weapons are, you know, a lot of them are very similar to the Soviet weapons. So they could cover their track. So so they sh uh, to get those weapons, uh, you know, China built a road to off, uh, to Pakistan, the Karakoram Highway, which was finished in 1979, right around the time of Soviet invasion. So so say CIA was arranged to have trucks loaded with uh, <laughs> with the Chinese weapons coming to Pakistan to supply the Mujahideen. And there was a, a funny story about mules because, you know, as we know, Afghan is a very mountainous country and with not many roads. So CIA initially supplied uh, Tennessee mules to Afghan Mujahideen <laughs> for transport. But the Tennessee mules couldn't hack it in the harsh climate of Afghanistan. They start to die in mass. So CIA ended up doing is that they purchased tons of mules from Xinjiang in China and have the mules shipped over to Pakistan to, to supply the Afghan Mujahideen. So in this movement, not just the arms and mules that move across the border, you know, some or young Uyghurs, um, when China opened up in the 80s, some young Uyghurs also traveled through Karakoram Highway into Pakistan. Uh, some of them made it to those madrasas that was founded by Saudi Arabia along the border with Afghanistan to basically in, in indoctrinate the Afghan refugees with the uh, you know the the Saudi Wahhabism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can and, see some of that spilling over too into yes. like the Uyghur culture and, and kind of take root in China because you know what I'm saying you using the same facet of people to deal with each other the same way we supported uh, you know Osama bin Laden who was from Saudi and. Afghan, you know, it kind of spilt over that same type of culture. So yes, so and and the the special case with China is, you know, in nineteen, you know, China went through this period in Cultural Revolution when, at that time, all religions were banned in China. You know, like all schools, Buddhist temples, mosques were all closed. And then in nineteen eighties, the after end of Cultural Revolution, those mosques were reopened. Right. And, the, you know, some mosques were rebuilt and the, the mullahs were being released from, from education camps and went back to teaching. But then at this juncture, you know, like the, the, a lot of the young Uyghur people have grown up without kind of like the traditional uh, Islamic teaching. They went over to Afghanistan and they they got um, kind of, they got in contact with the uh, Saudi Saudi style religious fundamentalism, and they come back to Xinjiang and say, "We brought the real Islam, right? We got it from straight from the Arabs, from the Saudi Arabia, from the from the people from Saudi Arabia, right? Yeah. And this is a pure Islam. The Islam we have in here is it's corrupted, you know, like all these mullahs that 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 in the state uh, sponsor, and that's another." feature in, in in china is that because uh in the 1950s uh, under the land reform china took away all the land from the mosque and the buddhist monasteries but but in order for the mosque and buddhist monastery to to reopen uh then chinese government provide funds to keep the mosque and buddhist monastery open right so 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 now but essentially all the mosque and the 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 Buddhist temples in China are state funded, right? Because because the state took away their land holding and redistributed the land, and now the source for funding comes from the state itself. So now these these uh, young Uyghur who got radicalized, they come back. They say, you know, these mosques are being tainted. They're being supported by the communist party, right? The communist government. So yeah. so they're they're not the. They're not they're not teaching real Islam there. You know, the the the, the Islam they taught there has been 
contaminated by unbelievers, by by kafurs, right? <laughs> and 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 they started to have these like underground cells where they they kind of do a lot of prostatizing, um, especially to kids like teenagers, and 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 they get a lot of uh, and, and that's how it became a problem in Xinjiang start and, and sitting on against this background was ending the Cold War. China was opening up and uh, with the economic liberalization, there were a lot of social problems was, was introduced. Uh, first, it was like a problem of inequality that was in, reintroduced uh, uh, by the economic growth. And and then the, the, with the border trade was opening up. You know, in the 1990s, one of the big problems in Xinjiang was, you know, uh, alcoholism, uh, drug use. And and so these uh, ra radical Islamists in their underground cell, they, they had they, they're very smart to play this. So they, you know, they urge people to refrain from alcohol. Uh, refrain from drug use. These are all good things. So, so they naturally have a lot of appeal among the masses, right? But yeah. their agenda came later. You know, the first they got people to to join their organization. But once they, they have their, uh, once they kind of take over the village level, then they s implement the Taliban style rule where women like have that. to. Win. It's kind of crazy because I never really connected the docs back to 1980 and Operation Cyclone mm. with the Mujahideen, not even realizing how many weapons did come through China that were actually made in China. And that's very true. I was reading a lot of articles on that. But is there any evidence today that it's still being funded in Xinjiang from Western CIA influence or even Saudi Wahhabist Calif uh, Salafist that are being okay, funded so, there? Yeah, there's no direct um, influence in because you know, China has locked down the border since 2009, right? So people, the, uh, the, 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 the original core of people uh, of, of, of radical Islamists based in Afghanistan. They were, it's it's in Afghanistan where they got radicalized, and they infiltrate back into Xinjiang and start doing their prostatizing among the masses, right? So so it's not a direct link to Saudi Arabia and CIA. Uh, well, uh, 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 Afghanistan, a lot of their funding comes, you know, a lot of their, uh, you know, funding, a lot of funding comes from Saudi Arabia into Afghanistan. So it's just yeah. another fast it goes from one place to the other so i mean yes 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 um but what happened you know in 19 so so in, in this, this is a so the chinese government they because they're 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 still communists they believe in you know they have a ideologically they believe everything is economics they, they believe uh you know if they just develop xinjiang economically all the problem will go away. So there was a lot of uh, investment then went into Xinjiang to develop the place, but there's not there, there are also problems with this policy because you know with with the additional state capital that was injected into Xinjiang. So Xinjiang um, before it has, as I mentioned, it already has kind of a, uh, like a like a different. Uh, a lot of ethnic groups already living in Xinjiang, and there's already a, a ethnic divide between kind of the non-Muslim and the non the Muslim population. But before 1980s, uh, you know, everybody gets state assigned jobs, right? You know, so so basically everybody was was poor, but everybody gets a state assigned jobs. So so everything, at least on paper, is relatively equal. But with the economical liberalization. What happened is the Han Chinese in Xinjiang, they have connections with your, you know, their relatives and families in other parts of China, right? Like in the, especially in the coastal part of China, where a lot of the factories are being uh, set up for for export, um, and 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 that connection allowed the 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 Han, Chi you know, the Han Chinese to 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 profit. To I mean to to profit more to gain more from this economic liberalization. Shouldn't, it, shouldn't there something be said about that? Then I mean that seems like an unfair advantage for more uh, ethnic Chinese people, Han Chinese people, to get uh, a, a bigger leg up than the Uyghurs that were living in Xinjiang 
and they can certainly feel shut out. No. Yes. Yes. Because because um, like I said, this is a very complex story. Because you know, as I mentioned before, the schools in Xinjiang were teaching you know the people in the local language, so people could go through. Elementary school to college to to be only speaking Uyghur, you know, to be edu wholly educated in the Uyghur language. But the problem on that that became a problem after the economic liberalization because in the globalized economy, Absolutely. obviously the people who are educated in standard Mandarin they have they're going to get more of the jobs. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so that, a lot that, of the, a lot of the, I mean, how do, how does China combat that? How does the government combat that when you have separatists who really want to stay within the culture of the Uyghur, you know, society, speak their own language, whatnot? But your your economy is so plugged into understanding ma uh, Mandarin to get all those jobs. How does Xi Jinping and the government face a challenge like that without being pointed at from the international community as favoring one group of Chinese people over another? Right. So, so in the last um, uh, last five seven, seven years, there has been a campaign to push bilingual education in Xinjiang, right? The, which was being criticized by the Western media. So before is you know the Uyghurs have the option of going to Uyghur only school, or they can be go to choose to go to like a, a Mandarin school, right? So now yeah. they're, they're they're phasing out. Uh, they're now they're trying to integrate into one program where uh, all Uyghurs would be educated um, in Mandarin as well. So 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 it would be a, a, across the board bilingual education. So that would open the door for Uyghurs in Western Xinjiang yes. to be to get more jobs to enrich their yeah. their own community, whatnot. Because I think a lot of uh, Western media always kind of looks at like them being taught. Chinese Mandarin society as educating them because they don't want them to be proud about who they are. But I, this is something I'm learning right now because I never understood that Uyghurs were so involved, entrenched in their own language and their own culture that it really separated them from plugging yeah. into the main Chinese economy. Yes, yes, and and uh, so this this is a Chinese government approach. So one is bilingual education, and two is they're they're building more. Uh, roads to connect the region to the rest of China, also to the rest of the world. So now, you know, China are building railway links to Kazakhstan, to Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and they're building more roads to Pakistan. So the Belt and so Silk Initiative, right? The Belt, the yes, the yes. Belt Road Initiative, and she, you know, no. I think they kind of compare it to the Silk Road that they did years ago uh, in ancient China, uh, and now they're talking that this is a good thing. The Belt initiative right because it's going the belt road initiative it's going to lift people out of poverty no yes 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 and and one of xinjiang happened to be the linchpin of the build belt and road initiative because the belt and road initiative is two parts the belt is a called the so-called the silk road uh, economic belt and the road is a marine time silk road it's kind of counterintuitive but but on the overland silk road all go through Xinjiang. You know, it, it, the railroads links go from Xinjiang to Kazakhstan to Russia to Mongolia to uh, to to um to to Uzbekistan to Pakistan, and China is also investing heavily into Pakistan right now uh, to build a port in Gwadar. So that will allow products goods in Xinjiang to be able to ship across the border. Uh, down Pakistan to the, the uh, port of Gwadar and directly export uh, to the Persian Gulf, right? Yeah, so that, yeah. that, that, that is the China's plan. And then the, also the, the oil exports uh, from Persian Gulf then they come, can come through Gwadar and be piped through, through Xinjiang. So Xinjiang strategic, geostrategically is very important for China. Um, yeah. I mean, you can probably argue that maybe that's also why U.S. has interest to see well, that. Well, yeah. Fail. Same thing with Hong Kong. It's a geopolitical move to kind of, uh, you know, uh, demonize China and Beijing for their behaviors. You know, they try to make it look like Hong Kong is one of these things where they're really. And you shed a lot of light on this situation when it came to Hong Kong, uh, especially with the, the, a lot of the Hong Kong uh, citizens treated a lot of the Chinese mainlanders. Uh, in a racial 
way that was so just uh, kind of disgusting. What are your thoughts, jumping to Hong Kong real quick because we have to wrap the show up, what are your yep. thoughts about the new law, Article 63, in which China's finally putting their foot down to get American NGOs out of there uh, and, and really nip it in the butt for groups like the NED that are anything but the National Endowment for the Democracy? Yeah, so this is funny because, you know, before the uh, national security law passed in Hong Kong, uh, in the past, we have been talking, I have been talking about, you know, the American support for these, uh, you know, the, the, the anti-China groups in Hong Kong, right? But people say, you know, what is the proof? What is your proof that NED are support funding this? You know, I showed the, 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 the funding page from NED website showing yeah. they're funneling <laughs> over it. <laughs> And some millions of dollars. But what the, what the funny thing is, right after the national security law has passed in Hong Kong that banned basically foreign funding for anti-government groups, Trump administration just announced they're suspending funding to Hong Kong. You know, to, uh, I forgot what's the exact number. It's several million dollars from the NED. And, and it's just... I mean, this is just too much of a coincidence, right? <laughs> nah, yeah, I know. I, I, I think he's smart. He can use that money from the NED in other countries like Bolivia or, yeah. you know, when he uses groups right, like right, the right. OAS. And uh, I think Americans need to wake up to the fact that these NGOs are like regime change uh, aficionados that are really, really uh, just, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they, they flex their military might against other countries like China, like Russia. Uh, and other countries that want to kind of detach from Western empire. Um, man, thank you so much for coming on today. I know, listen, the Silk and Steel podcast, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't picked, checked it out, you need to check it out. Um, it, it talks about Chinese culture, history. We learned a lot today with the whole Uyghur situation. Uh, and really, you know, what is your final grade? Actually, uh, I really, I got a question. We got a couple questions too. Question. Johnny's over here, but what is your final grade? And Johnny's going to hold that question for Xi Jinping's government on the treatment of the Uyghurs and their grade on how they're handling the Hong Kong situation. And then Johnny's got a couple questions. Okay. Um, I will give Xi Jinping's uh, handling of uh, the, the Xinjiang situation C plus uh, and, and, and B minus for the Hong Kong situation. And I'll, I'll give you a reason why. Um, so I understand the Chinese government's motivations into integrate Xinjiang with the rest part of China. But what I am have concern about is the actual implementation on the ground, the actual practice, how it affects people's everyday life. Because I, I, I know how Chinese uh, censorship is, is being carried out, right? I, I experienced that firsthand. So I know there's, you know, like when, when the policy gets translated uh, implemented on the ground. Sometimes a lot depends on the people who are carrying out the implementation, right? So it, 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 sometimes it doesn't even matter what the what the intention, original intention was, but yeah. it's it's very subjective. So so in in, in that case, um, you know what what China is trying to do is uh, it's it's a social engineering project. It's trying to reverse. Uh, you can argue that it's trying to reverse the kind of the the, the turn toward towards the Islamization in Xinjiang in the last twenty years, um, but it it, 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 I, it is heavy handed. I you know I have it to is. say it it's is a tricky I, situation. But then, yeah. but then again, I don't have the answers. I don't know what you know. I really don't have the answer how that can be best approached. I yeah. mean, right now we don't really have a like a good example to look to like, a, like, a no, good... I know we don't, we don't have the answer and that's a problem. What about the B plus in Hong Kong? Why? Right. Okay. So, uh, I, I will give you a reason why the, 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 the Chinese government do a good job right now to explain their, their, um, situation to mainland Chinese people on Hong Kong, their policies. So that's why a lot of the mainland Chinese people are behind uh, the PRC government in terms of their handling of Hong Kong. But they have failed to appeal to the Hong Kong youth who makes a, a bulk of the movement, right, in, in, in the protest movement. But how, how do they do that when, when the problems that the youth have 
totally go on the austerity measures put on by the British colonies of Hong Kong. I mean, Chinese mainlanders, they're being moved out of poverty, while Hong Kong youth cannot get a job and they're moving into poverty. How can we, yeah. how can Xi Jinping address that? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. yes, this is a very, again, this is a very complex issue. The, the, the problem, uh, you know, Hong Kong experience is very similar to the problem that youth in the Western nations like United States are experiencing, Absolutely. which is diminished economic pro uh, prospect, right? Yes. Because, because Hong Kong used to be one of the five, you know, one of the four Asian tiger economies, right? And then, but then manufacturing start to move off to mainland China. And then, you know, Hong Kong become a service economy, uh, increasingly financialized, you know, but, but then, it's it's that it's the tide is not lifting all boats in Hong Kong and and you know the, the also the, the this is the, the problem that the Hong Kong China, Chinese government have been hands off in Hong Kong for far too long under way the, too long way under too long there's a one country two system I mean it's a great formulation in 1980s because you kind of kind of Chinese government at the time was worried about you know, the Hong Kong capitalists fleeing Hong Kong, you know, taking their capital with them because they're, they're afraid of the communist takeover. So they granted the, the, the autonomy and they allowed the, you know, basically the, the Hong Kongers to rule Hong Kong, which is great in concept. But what ha ended up happening was that the Hong Kong government become do and Hong Kong legislature become dominated by business, business interests, by the big Hong Kong uh, oligarchy. And... And the, the, the Hong Jimmy Kong Lai? Yes, yes, people like Jimmy Lai, right? And and yeah. then and then these the Jimmy Lai people like Jimmy Lai and very clever. They they turn all these popular discontent, redirect it from themselves and, and redirect it against the central Chinese government. Right? And yeah. then this this is this uh, you know, the the, the 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 there there's a real problem facing the Hong Kong youth is you know that they, they need better economic uh Opportunity. opportunities and they need a path forward and yes. it's going to be a very very hard situation uh and uh listen we got to get out of here but johnny has a couple questions i really personally think i gave him an a minus for hong kong uh mm -hmm. xi jinping real quick carl because he did exactly um he did exactly the same thing that Putin did when it came to Ukraine, and that's that he exercised restraint. It seemed like the NED and all these NGOs were pouring gasoline on the fire, which they really should be ashamed about, the way they really in, in, inflamed this situation in Hong Kong, using the youth against their own, you know, their own, against what they're really facing. And the fact that uh, Xi Jinping, just like Putin, has shown restraint and hasn't sent in his centralized uh, police forces, I think is really, really good because in this movement in Hong Kong, there were a lot of older mainlander Chinese people that were getting beat up yeah. and it, it really wasn't fair to them. But Johnny has a question, Carl. Thank you for those answers. Johnny, our editor, engineer. So a lot of people make that argument that uh, when, when Pasta talks about China, they always bring up the Uyghurs. So uh, why do they bring this up? It's because uh, there, there is a Uyghur camp. It's there is a, uh, a camp where they're holding Uyghurs, correct? Did you hear that, Carl? No, can you repeat the question? Oh, he goes, he said, I'm sorry, he said that, uh, maybe your mic's not on. He said that a lot of people always do bring up the Uyghurs when it comes to Western media and stuff. There is a camp where Uyghurs are being held, right? The BBC story. Yes. Uh, and I think you, you kind of tie that in with the whole language thing. But why do people bring up the Uyghurs all the time? Well, okay. So about the camps. So there, there are edu re-education camps in China. There's no, no denying that. The, again, we don't know the numbers. The, the, the numbers that we're throwing around in Western media, uh, you know, one million, three million, all yeah. of them can be traced to Adrian Zenz, who is a researcher from the victim of communism uh, organization. Yep. Which is, I know, you know he is. <laughs> as a, as a, with a sterling reputation. Victims of communism. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly, and and then we we in the the the, the re, so the re-education camp. Um, by the way, the the China, Chinese government have claimed last uh, June that most of the camp have been closed, and most of the, the 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 people there have quote unquote graduated. 
Now that's been disputed, right? Well, uh, so, so, some some people have reported that their relatives are now back home, and uh, while um, some Uy Uyghur exile have claimed that they they still haven't heard from their own relatives, or, or their own relatives have been sent into prison. I think th this this has always been like kind of the the, the Chinese program from the beginning. They they their their goal was to um, for the people who've been radicalized. They want let them go back to the the wider society and and there's also uh, the, the job program you know that was very much a uh, part of the chinese program now that job program has been maligned in the western media as you know slave labor and, and so on like what chinese government is uh, attempting to do is is setting up factories <laughs> otherwise might be influenced by fundamental uh, extremism right and and this like all the reports about the Xinjiang slave camp factories uh, that we have seen that the latest one was about the the supposedly human real human hair harvested from detainee in the region. yeah yeah that's the new one I actually read through the article other than the, the, they mentioned the claim in the first paragraph, and then if you read on, there was no source, no any more for. You there, Carl? Oh shit! We might have lost them at the very end. Yes, this is reconnecting. Let's see. We just want to be able to say goodbye to him. This has been educational. It's a tough, tough, tough. Uh... Wow. We're done? We were talking about Uyghurs. And... <laughs> Did we get shut down? No, it's reconnecting. This is reconnecting. All right. So you can't talk about you. You just Somebody was even saying in the chat, stop, Pasta. You're going to get this guy Epstein over here for talking too much about the Uyghurs, whatnot. Ah, it's been a long show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see if we can get him on if we can. If not, check out the Silk and Steel podcast with Carl Za. Check out his Twitter. Uh, it's Silk and Steel is a podcast all about Chinese culture, history, politics, talking about the Silk, uh, Silk Road of ancient China and how uh, trade and commerce was moved all around that region, how Buddhism was exported from India to China, all these great things. And he plugs it into the geopolitics of today. Uh, he was always retweeted by... A lot of guys on the gray zone, uh, including um, Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate, uh, Ben Norton. So a lot of guys go to this gentleman here. Here, oh, thank you so much for the super chat contribution, Iran XXX. Thank you so much, guys. We love you for doing that. Oh, hit us up, let us know. Uh, but guys, no, I mean, uh, it's not that Matthew. I don't want. I can't wait to end this. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, really, we learned a lot today, and I talked about the Uyghurs. We talked about the Uyghurs that they were trying to not re-educate them, but educate them because of the economics of China, where you to get a lot of these jobs, you had to speak Mandarin, you had to understand the culture. So what we saw in the BBC, and I would always say, like, why aren't we doing this in our prisons? Why aren't we having, like, class and education and stuff to acclimate people into society? And it's not just because they're Muslim. It's because they didn't speak the language and they weren't plugged in. And at least that's what Carl's saying. Uh, this is the first time I've ever heard that. Uh, but it does give an understanding to what we were told is going on over there. Anyways. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's kind of interesting. I mean, uh, he was saying that it was because they were extremists, right? Well, they're separatists. He said the separatists, along with the extremism, was kind of lumped in together. So it's not even that the extremist that was also born out of Operation Cyclone, which was in the 1980s. The uh, Chinese uh, uh, roads were used to smuggle a lot of weapons into the Mujahideen who were the Afghani freedom fighters fighting against the Ruskies. Uh, and a lot of that culture set on in because that's the type of element that we're using to funnel weapons into the CIA. I'm, tr I'm just so. trying to figure out, like, what comparison can we make to Americans for what these Uyghur camps would be? Because uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't see a comparison. I mean... No, I, I don't either. Um, 
it would be really, really hard. I, I was I, I was I, thinking Guantanamo Bay at first, but then now yeah. not even. No, because you, you're going to say like it, it would be like indigenous people that you know we kind of like took over most of their land. And let's say there's a group of uh, they Native tried Americans. to do something like of, of Native Americans that didn't speak the language, and we tried to teach them to acclimate them into our business, into our society. You know what I'm saying? Right. But remember, Chinese culture, especially from the 1980s, has all been about their workforce. That's how they grew as a country. They made, they worked hard. They made products, and they sold those products all over the world. So, if you weren't plugged into that society as a everyday average Chinese citizen, you struggled financially, and you weren't able to feed your family. But you know, to do that, you know, to plug them into Chinese culture, and I think a lot of it too, as well as the separatists, should they be able to separate? You yeah, know what I'm saying? That's, 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 that's part of the question. answer. That's, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't think China wants that because it might interfere with the Belt and Road Initiative because U.S. will fucking run into that, <laughs> right? Right there. If they, they separated, they, the U.S. Yep. will be there in a second, right? In a second. We'll have to move that <laughs> Belt and Road Initiative and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I, and once again, it could be too like a big facet. You know, when I watched the BBC special and I looked at the Uyghur special, you know, it was they were trying to teach them language and culture, and whatnot. And it wasn't like something that was like whips and change and really it was a lot of people there, whatnot. Now, the way the Western media framed it is like, look, at they're trying to really hypnotize these people and change them away from their culture and move them away from their religion. And it's disgusting that they're doing it. But from the story that just was told to us by Carl Za, it was no, it was to acclimate them into the business of Chinese, Chinese business, which is you have to speak the Mandarin language. You have to understand the culture. So therefore you can get that money and feed your family. All right. So I, I once it, listen. It's a yeah, new I wish aspect. We could go like another hour because it was getting really interesting. It was bringing yeah. really like really other perspectives that I, I haven't heard. It'd yeah. be interesting if we can get a Uyghur on the show. <laughs> it would be, you know, it would be. Uh, listen, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna have Danny Haifang on, but we will hopefully we, maybe we can find a Uyghur to put on here. So let's put our uh, hooks and hooks out there in the water, ladies and gentlemen. If you know anybody who would like to come on the show, whether it you know, anti-China, and they're very upset with the Chinese government and their Uyghur, or somebody who's just from China is upset with their government would like to speak let's out. Let's hear it. Please, let's hear it. We're here and open for it. The main reason that why I do this... censorship thing was kind of scary, too. What's that? That censorship thing. The way the censorship is, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, it's like same thing as us, in a way. <laughs> You're like, they don't even tell you. Well, no, uh, one's, no one's come knocking to the door yet. Not yet. But, they, but you know... People have been Seth Rich. So. Invited, invited for tea. Exactly. A lot of people commit suicide instead of getting invited for tea. So, uh, it, it was very interesting. <laughs> They're nicer authoritarian. They're, they have a nice authoritarian <laughs> way over there. Can you come for tea before we stab you in the heart? But uh, it, it was interesting. That was Carl Zah, ladies and gentlemen. Go out and check the Silk and Steel podcast. Go to his website. Go to his Twitter. He's amazing. He put so much food up there. And, you know, I always say we build bridge. We build bridges at dinner. That's how uh, cultures combine and talk to one another. They share each other's food. And that's why I've always been interested in getting Carl on. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Johnny, anything else? Nope, that's it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back tomorrow for Pasta Jardula and Johnny Sue on the ones and twos. Carl Za was here. Combo out. Check out his podcast. Thank you again for joining us. And thank you for the Super Chat contributions.